looking at the technological advances. I used to be on dial up looking for. Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Let's talk about some NXT. How about that? All right. So this episode of NXT was okay. It was all right. Um, it wasn't too bad. wasn't all that great. But there was some good stuff on here. It was some good nuggets. Some good nuggets. So the first match, Hit Row versus Legado del Fantasma. Match was solid. Ended the disqualification as Santos Escobar hit top dollar with a chair. And then they, they commenced 250-50 book a post-match brawl. Can we please just let somebody get over? Here's what I mean. And I'm pretty sure if you're smart, you already know what I mean. Legado del Fantasma had the numeric advantage after the top dollar got... Uh, hit with a chair and Swerve got destroyed and thrown out of the ring or something like that. No, actually, it was I think it was Ashanti the Adonis who got thrown out of the ring. They beat up Swerve, took his grill, then they were going to pilmanize him by putting his head on a, in uh, in the chair. Uh, Top Dolly managed to pull him out the ring and, and saved him. Then B Fab hit uh, Santos Escobar in the back with the chair. From there, then Hit Row take over and they bump uh, Legato de Fantasma and those guys roll away. So they 50-50 booked a post-match brawl. Instead of just letting the Legato de Fantasma beat them up and leave them laying, you know, one at a time, beat them up, leave them laying, and then let BFAP scream and say, stop, you know, and then maybe they threaten to do something with her. Then, and let that be that, and let uh, Legato de Fantasma had a the heat. They had them fight back. And Why? Why do they need to do that? Oh. And you have the baby faces that have the numeric advantage. That's already weird. Right? There's four members of the baby face group, three members of the heel group. This just means that we probably need a female member to Legato del Fantasma. I know Katarina has been on the roster forever. I don't know. If she, is, did she still work there? Did they fire Katarina? Catalina? Katarina? Whatever fuck her name was. I don't think so. Anyway, uh, Escobar still got Swerve's grill. In any event, let's move on. William Regal says that he didn't want any issues between Cross and Joe and that he's going to make sure there's no no contact between the two of them until TakeOver. Later, Cross says that the show is out of control and that Je Samoa Joe can't control everything. And then he says, who provoked who? And this leads Joe to march into the ring and end up beating up security because he wants to get at Cross so badly. This is very awkward. This is very, very awkward. This is operating like in a different universe um, at this point. Where we got Cross on Raw doing something completely different than what Cross is doing in NXT. It's so weird. Why are we doing this? I'm not even going to talk about the, you know, him losing. I mean, it is what it is. I'm just at this point like, why we have, why do we, why did this, when did this character bifurcate? I know when it happened. But why do they choose to, this character specifically, is going to go into two different directions where he's not wrestling on NXT, so the only matches he's having are on Raw, and he's losing those matches. He's lost two matches so far on Raw. He hasn't wrestled at all on NXT, and NXT does not mention that he's even on Raw. Now, obviously you're not going to mention it because these episodes are taped and Raw is live, so that means... That you watched this guy get power bombed and pinned just the day before this. <laughs> uh, it's it's really strange. It's it's like watching uh, it's like watching like Smoky Mountain or USWA or something like that. And then you see this guy, he's like the Southern Heavyweight Champion or whatever the hell in in one of these podunk promotions that come on at like eleven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And then you see him on Superstars, and he's just like a no-name job guy, some Freddie Joe Floyd motherfucker who gets who, who doesn't get any offense in and gets like beat down by Isaac Ankum DDS or something like that. It's a weird decision, you know. It's a really weird decision, and that's kind of how I felt. <laughs> I feel like I'm a kid again. Like you see somebody that's kind of they're kind of just unstoppable badass. What was that? The, the pretty, I, let me use a real example. I think it was the dirty white boy Tony Anthony. And then I think he was also T.L. Hopper, you know, so like I was watching Smoky Mountain and this guy's like a champion and I then I watch Superstars and he's walking around with a plunger and a filthy shirt. And I'm just kind of like, I don't, uh, huh? It didn't even strike me as being 
an important thing at the time. But as I see this carrying cross thing happening, this is kind of how it, how it works for me. I'm just kind of looking at it like this is tremendous. It's like when you saw when I saw Brian Christopher for the first time, and he was actually like a, a big deal in USWA. And then he comes up to the WWF and it's just like, Brian Christopher, job guy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. All right. So um, in any event, Dexter Loomis is drawing pictures of, in, of Index and the Larrays. Um, no Austin Theory. We then get uh, to build upon this story. We got Johnny Gargano who says that he's been part of some of the biggest matches in NXT and that he knows what's best for Indy. And uh, he's going to do what's best for Indy and what's best for Indy is to keep uh, Dexter Loomis out of the match, out of the family, rather. Uh, Indy Hartwell then says later in the show that it's complicated because this is family versus true love and that she thinks Dexter Loomis is just misunderstood. So then they go in and they have the match. Love her or leave her, Johnny Gargano versus Dexter Loomis. And what did I say should happen last week? I need to become good at editing. Like if I was a good editor at, of of this of this type of YouTube thing, I would edit in a piece where I said exactly what should happen, and that's exactly what did happen. Dexter Loomis lost, but Indy Hartwell left anyway and kissed all over him and everything. To me, it could have been a little bit more dramatic. This is where you should bring bring in some of that Shawn Michaels melodrama. They did okay with, you know, Indy Hartwell looking back at him lovingly and then she runs back and jumps into his arms and everything. But it should have been a thing where maybe they tried to hold her back and she was shoving them and pushing past them and everything. And maybe you off camera without a microphone, they say, if you leave, we don't, we don't ever want to see you again. It's over. You're out of the family. And then she says, screw them and goes, gets back into the ring. But I kind of saw this coming. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people did, maybe. you know, Just another reason to put Johnny Gargano over again or somebody he has no business beating. But I was thinking about this as I was watching this match. What can you do with Dexter Loomis on the main roster? He doesn't cut promos. He doesn't talk. So you know that's going to be the first thing Vince make him do the moment he comes up to like SmackDown. It's going to be like, got to cut a promo, pal. People don't know who you are. Tell them who you are. Tell them about yourself. And it's going to be like, my name is Dexter Loomis, and I like to draw pictures. And it's going to be death nail for the entire character already. But I don't know. I don't know how much longer he can come on possibly be there. Like, how long, much longer can you keep Dexter Loomis in NXT? He's not going to win a title. He's not going to do anything. He even lost the girl. How much longer are you going to keep him there? Get him out of there. You know, get him out of NXT, please. Uh, Frankie Monet, pretty upset, blamed... Uh, Robert Stone for her losing said that him and Jesse are used to losing because they're losers and says that she's going to rebuild the Robert Stone brand in her own image. And they're going to do this Frankie's way. Perfectly fine. Uh, they're leaning into, I guess, a little bit of a meaner side or mean streak of uh, Frankie Monet. They're going to keep her with Robert Stone, which is smart. Keep uh, Jesse Kamea with her, which is also smart. She probably needs another second. Another another young girl. It's got to be somebody else there um, that she can work with. And um, I like the idea of letting or using Taya, I'm sorry, Frankie as a mentor to some of the younger girls. Um, I just wish Aaliyah could have stayed there a little bit longer or they could have brought over somebody from NXT UK. And, you know, just to build up a little bit of a stable. And maybe Robert Stone can actually do something now instead of just standing around not wearing socks. Uh, uh, Roderick Strong defeated Bobby Fish in a pretty solid match. Um, I enjoyed this match more than I thought I would. I thought, you know, Plankton or Plank, not Plankton, Plank, I'm sorry, was actually going to bore me to death as he did last week. But Roderick Strong is a boring individual. He's very boring. Um, he's beyond boring, to be quite honest. But he's a when you when you want to watch a work rate match, he's the right guy to w watch a work rate match with. Still, to date, the best Roderick Strong match I've ever seen was his match with Bobby Roode for the NXT title because they put so much emphasis on it, uh, on his family, on his background, on his upbringing. It's just so emotional, and I really wanted Roderick Strong to win that match so badly, and uh, I was a little bit heartbroken when he lost. But I think that was kind of like the peak of his character, to be quite honest. The Undisputed Era was basically uh, inflating him, keeping him alive. But um, I think we've reached peak Roderick Strong. But 
at the same time, he might hit a new a new plateau. Uh, Kushida says that he was impressed with uh, Roderick Strong and offers him a title match for the Cruiserweight title, which I'm guessing Roderick Strong is going to win. Kushida, not a bad guy at all, um, but unfortunately, the promo skills are not going to be there. And Diamond Mine was, was specifically put together probably for this to push Roderick Strong. I think beating Roderick Strong probably would be a bad idea. But you need to do something with Kushida. He's been on the roster for over a year now, probably two years. And Kushida hasn't done anything. You know, he's just kind of been stuck in the middle. Another one of those guys who probably got would have gotten a big run if it wasn't for the Undisputed Era and Tommaso Ciampa and all those guys. Um, so hopefully Kushida can go to the next level. I don't know what that means. Like for, But maybe we get some Samoa Joe Kushida stuff when Samoa Joe gets the belt. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. So let's move on to L.A. Knight and Cameron Grimes. So they argue, uh, well, not really argue, but much as L.A. Knight just wanted to make sure that Cameron Grimes has his back for this match. And then likewise, Cameron Grimes wants to know that L.A. Knight has his back. Then um, he makes Cameron Grimes buff his boots. And I was like, whoa, talk about getting hold, dog. <laughs> Boy, you talking about getting hold. There it is. So Cameron Grimes versus L and LA Knight versus the Grizzled Young Veterans. And I still love the Grizzled Young Veterans. Um, they got a great theme song too, by the way. Their theme song is dope. So um, the Grizzled Young Veterans cut a promo. Basically says that Cameron Grimes is proof that you can't polish a turd. And that in and out of the ring, they need to stay out of their way. And that, um, and what we get in this match was, you know, the potential to be a pretty good match. But it was mostly an angle. You know, Cameron Grimes was pretty, pretty much left by himself. And uh, L.A. Knight kind of took off. And Knight told him, like, look, go win the match. Go ahead. You know, and Grimes tried it. Took his gloves off and, you know, got some pretty decent offense in. And ultimately, the numbers game caught up with him and took it to Mayhem. And he lost. Makes sense. There's no shame in losing a handicap match. Uh, then Ted DiBiase came out there. And I will never ever ever get over Ted DiBiase being the fairy godfather for Cameron Grimes and he tells Cameron Grimes like look I know you're a man of your word but you got to find a way out of this you can't keep losing like this you can't keep embarrassing yourself and Cameron Grimes is looking like okay Uncle Ted whatever you say man and uh Teddy actually helped him to the back I don't know man the baby face Ted DiBiase still is is still <laughs> It's still not getting me where I want to go. But um, Cameron Grimes is phenomenal. He's very good. And the crowd is really, really, really behind him. And LA Knight has, you know, he has such charisma. He's great. And then we get this fantastic promo from Dakota Kai where it should have been me. It should have been me. Uh, that's really what it boils down to. It's <laughs> Dakota Kai thinks that she should have gotten the match with Io Shirai. She should have been the big star. She should have been there with Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair because she found Raquel Gonzalez and Raquel Gonzalez is ungrateful and has forgotten where she's come from. And you know what? I like this. I thought this was great. We need to show promos like this all the time. You know, every storyline should have a sit down promo like this. This is the thing that Ring of Honor does that makes it so much more bearable than most other wrestling shows. Is that everybody who's going to be in the match, mostly everybody who's going to be in the match talks. And they talk about the match. They talk about their opponent, their relationship to their opponent, their relationship to their current situation. You know, Dakota Kai is discussing that she was not even considered a challenge for to Ra Raquel Gonzalez. And that she wasn't even considered a challenge for Io Shirai, that she was being looked over. And that's basically like her career. Like, look, I've been winning. We've been doing well. You know, but, you know, I keep getting looked over. And then she said, look, I would even settle for the tag team titles. But Raquel didn't want to put her full heart and soul into the tag team. So now she's left me with only one option. And that option is to be the NXT Women's Champion. I'm like, okay, I still don't have, I still have zero faith that uh, Dakota Kai is going to win that match. But at least... At the very least, we're doing a good job telling the story. 
So they told this thing about, uh, they showed some clips of Adam Cole getting beaten up. And uh, they said that Adam Cole was not medically clear to compete, but will be facing off with Kyle O'Reilly face to face next week. Um, of course, people pounced on that. Oh, y'all know that he's leaving. So you said that he can't. It's like, bro, there it's a storyline. <laughs> People's contracts have been coming up and still they work matches. OK, plenty of people worked matches as their contracts were coming up. You know, it's likely that they'll set up whatever match is supposed to be. Nothing's going to, you know, if, they, if he was going to work with Kyle O'Reilly, it's going to happen. All right. Relax. I just thought it was weird that people were trying to be so smart. Like, look, no, this thing was taped before that news even came out. What are you talking about? Uh, Joe Gacy, who was one of the many people from Evolve that they brought into NXT. He's going to be in the breakout tournament. He is going to be wrestling Trey Baxter, a.k.a. Blake Christian. And he cut a promo essentially saying that he won't be controlled. I'm pretty sure Blake Christian cut a promo. I just probably missed it. I was making dinner at the time. Um, so maybe I missed his promo and it probably has something to do with him being all heart. In any event, Joe Gacy reminds me a lot of, uh, Kevin Owens. He looks like almost like his twin brother. They both have those trailer park bodies and, uh, but Joe Gacy got that bull ring in his nose and I, I hate that thing. I hate that thing so much. Oh, I hate that thing so much. But, um, Gacy is a big dude with another one of those big dudes with a motor where he can really work, um, I think that if it gave him the right gimmick, he could actually be something. I noticed that a lot of these guys in this tournament are just evolved guys doing jobs. You know, <laughs> like it's just, well, Ike Minjiro is not an evolved guy, but, you know, a lot of these guys are just evolved guys that he didn't fire. Um, they, they brought in to do jobs. I think that they'll end up uh, doing something because, you know, this tournament isn't the be all end all, even though Ike Min is already doing jobs. Um, so Trey Baxter wins with a 450 stomp, which is, of course, very, very extra. And uh, we, he, needs, he needs a sensible finish. He also needs a personality. Uh, Io Shirai and Zoe Stark went to eat Japanese food. And the only thing I could think of is Zoe Stark's shoulders. She's built like a battle toad. I have no idea why she's so, why she's so built. Why is she so muscular? And it's like strange because he's wearing like shirts with no sleeves. So you see the muscularity and the musculature of her arms and shoulders and shit. I'm like, man, what in the hell? Whatever. Anyway, they were telling the story about, you know, basically Zoe Stark is trying to butter up Io Shirai and be her friend. Io is not interested in being friends. So this didn't quite work out. But for a first vignette, it was actually not too bad. Not that bad. Um, not a lot of cringe comedy in it which is kind of what I was looking for in a buddy cop situation. I was looking for a little bit more cringe comedy. So um, maybe they will get there eventually. So the last thing for, their, for me to talk about is Ilya Dragunov and Walter. Because they did a great Ilya Dragunov and Walter promo on here. And Ilya Dragunov will actually be on NXT next week. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. Now... This match taking place. And you know what? You know what? Now that I think about it. NXT TakeOver 36. Um, as far as I know. Will not be in Las Vegas. It will, it's, not, it's not trailing SummerSlam this year. So they're doing it in the Capitol Wrestling Center. Which tells me that. Perhaps that's why they don't care about the Cross and Joe. It's because they're like, well, it's going to take place in the goddamn performance center. Who cares? Um, so we're just going to beat the shit out of Cross. But I think also uh, Ilya Dragunov. I was thinking maybe Ilya with Dragunov would win this match, would beat Walter and win the title. But then I was like, why? You know, like, it's not a gigantic crowd. It's not the right atmosphere. You know? Now, Shawn Michaels has done a good job of when he's booking NXT UK. Usually he has a top contender lose first and then they come back later and win. That's kind of been his gimmick for a little while now. Like he had uh, Tyler Bate, Russell, a kid for the Heritage Cup, I believe it was. And he beat him. And then a couple of weeks later, Tyler, Tyler Bate came back and won it. Um, and that match was even better than the first one. 
And I'm pretty sure after, you know, they'll probably have a kid come back to do a third match. They did it with uh, Mako Satomura and Kaylee Ray, where uh, after Mako won one match, she got a title shot against Kaylee Ray, and Kaylee Ray beat her clean. And then a couple of weeks later, Mako Satomura got a rematch and won it. Um, so I can definitely see, like, um, recently with Amel, uh, Amel, uh, the French Hope. Oh, my God, she's so fine. Anyway, uh, who boy, that girl fine. Anyway, um, she wrestled uh, Mako Satomura and lost. I can see her coming back later and probably winning the belt. Um, so it seems like that might be the 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 strategy that they do here. That they had Ilya Dragunov fight Walter for the title. He lost, and now he's probably going to win the rematch. And some people say, isn't that fifty fifty booking? It's like not really because it's not. They're not doing back-to-back matches. It's kind of like you lost. Now you have to build yourself back up. So it may take you several weeks, a month or two, maybe three. And then you get another title shot. And then you win that match. You know, it's because it almost seems like, okay, you lost. But now you have to go and repair yourself. You know, it's not an immediate, you know, win, loss, win, loss kind of deal. So I was thinking maybe that's why Dragunov would win this match. And then I was like, no, it's going to be in America. That would be reason enough to give it to Dragunov. But at the same time, it's not going to be a gigantic crowd. You're not going to get the big reaction that you want. Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe Walter just wins again. You know? And uh, I'm on the fence because I really like Ilya Dragunov. And I think if if he loses, um, you're talking about Ilya just being in America permanently. And I think maybe that's what we're going to talk about here is... Is Ilya Dragunov about to make his permanent move to NXT? And you know what? If they're about to pull Karrion Cross and a bunch of other people, I think a permanent move to NXT is great for Ilya Dragunov and several other people in NXT UK who have hit a ceiling. You know, I think Gallus have also hit a ceiling. Um, you know, the, the Coffee Brothers and Wolfgang. I think NXT, even though they already have some... Uh, some factions. I think a dominant male faction like Gallus can actually add a lot to the NXT brand. Um, I would have preferred if they had pulled Tyler Bate ass over here too, but he's got that heritage cup now. Um, Mustache Mountain could have been over. And I think that's as you sort of, if they decide to sort of start moving out the Garganos and the Coles or whatever, that's the next group of guys you really should be bringing in is like Mustache Mountain, uh, Ilya Dragunov, Gallus, the guys who've been in NXT UK since the beginning. Those are your next guys who should come in and be like your core NXT guys. Um, except for, of course, you have new NXT guys too. And then maybe some guys from somewhere else. But uh, I'm very interested in Walter and Ilya Dragunov for obvious reasons. Walter is a beast. He's not going to stay in the United States. So him coming to... Uh, win the NXT title, maybe. Like, that would be sweet, though, wouldn't it? If Walter won, lost the NXT UK belt to Ilya Dragunov, but we get Walter versus Samoa Joe at, like, SummerSlam, not SummerSlam takeover, but, like, WrestleMania takeover? Fuck! Could you imagine? Technically, I think Walter should just fuse those two belts, you know? That's no, that's another good idea. Why not just have Walter fuse the titles? You know, he can walk around with both belts. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. That's something I would do. I would do I would have Joe win the title from Cross and Joe would carry the belt until WrestleMania that weekend. And then I would have Joe versus Walter, title for title, at that show in the front of a big crowd. Whatever, I think it's going to be, what is, what's that, Dallas? They do WrestleMania at now? I would do it there. And I would do title for title. And I have Walter win both titles. And defend both titles. By then, the, the pandemic should hopefully be completely over. And he could travel a lot more. And then he just, he just defends both titles. That would be fucking sweet. That would be awesome. And it would be a great, um, a great uh, gimmick for Walter too. And it'll be like the best thing, be, next best thing to him being WWE champion is for him to be like the king of all NXT. You know, that would be sweet. But I'm getting, I'm getting a lot ahead of myself. I'm fantasy booking a lot. 
Um, anyway, uh, okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later, man. Like, share, subscribe, sponsor the show, and um, be good. Peace. Tell me what's worse than learning all that you led to believe was all horse crap. They distort so question as.